Check, check, check. You can actually remote shut the thing off. So it's kind of like having OnStar for your guitar. Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of the highest quality woven guitar, bag, and camera straps you'll ever see. Native Sons straps are handmade one at a time in the USA with unparalleled love and care. Click the link in the description to check out their new expanded lineup featuring all new 3-inch guitar straps. And remember, when you support my sponsor, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. Hey y'all, it's Shit Post Friday. Hey there boys and girls, Brad the Guitologist here. It is time again for Shit Post Friday. All right, we've got an action-packed Shit Post Friday this week for you. Uh, first up, there's a new Bill and Ted movie coming out in 2020. Excellent! And they've just released what appears to be the guitar for it, according to guitar.com. And it is, of course, a San Dimas Charvel. <gasps> It's interesting, uh, if you go back to the first Bill and Ted movie, um, they were using some kind of funky guitar. I forget exactly what they had. Also in the news, it appears that this story is going a bit viral. This is Sir Paul McCartney making his own guitar picks, pictured in New York's Hamptons, placing several one-cent coins along the tracks of the Long Island Railroad. You can visit one of my sponsors, Forever Pick, and you can uh, uh, buy these picks uh, that have been smashed in one of the uh, you know the hand crank smashing machines, and they actually work really, really well. I I have showed a couple of these in the past on the channel that I got from another fellow actually who uh, runs the Flatwoods Monster Museum in West Virginia and he sent me some of these and I absolutely love them. I, I adore these as picks. You can see there, you know, they're smashed in the little smashing machines. They're, so they're for like uh, tourists, you know, you go in the mu museum and you put your penny in and you probably put two quarters or four quarters or whatever also. And then you crank the thing and it smashes you a penny. But this thing is like perfect for a pick. And the problem with laying them on the tracks, as you can see in one of these photos, is that the, um, when you put a penny on the track like that, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't want to elongate. It kind of gets squashed flat, consistently round uh, more so. So you don't kind of get this elongated effect um, that's, you know, that gives you a better grip and gives you a more, more of a surface to grip on. So I'm not sure, you know, I've never tried that, putting uh, stuff on. I don't have a railroad uh, close to my house that runs, really. So uh, uh, I can't, you know, I can't do that easily. But, uh, you know, if you guys do have one, um, film it for me. Uh, do me a favor. Yeah, go take take some pennies out. Put them on the line if you live next to a railroad track and film it happening and see what they come out like. I would be really interested to see um, whether how well it works um, because it seems to me like, once again, that they would turn out a little bit too round for my taste, but um, it would just be interesting to see uh, what, especially also what Paul McCartney is using. Um, Apparently he's been doing this for a while. It looks like this is part of his kind of routine. So, very. I just thought it was interesting because we've talked about this on this channel before. Uh, you know, people putting this, uh, putting pennies on railroad tracks and having the train smash them into uh, guitar picks. And you know, just the fact that Paul McCartney is doing this is kind of neat. He could probably call somebody and just have them go get him a thousand guitar picks, but he's actually going out and doing this himself. You know. I think once you reach this age and you have this level of fame, you know, it's just like anything you can do probably to make your life seem or feel normal is is, is probably uh, is probably a really good thing. I doubt he can go very many places and not get recognized and uh, not get hounded and maybe somewhere you know besides some remote railroad tracks would be about the only place. <laughs> Pretty cool though. Okay, I saw this story also, and I'm, I'm highly skeptical, to be honest with you, of the merits of this particular story, um, but I thought I would share it with you anyway, just because it's kind of interesting and it's, it's recent. Uh, this was published on July the 30th 
the, of this year in uh, on a website called therichest.com, which I've never heard of before. So I don't, you know, I, again, I don't uh, know what how valid any of these numbers are that they, you know, purport to have. On this but I thought it was interesting they they count down the 10 highest paid guitarists in the world and I guarantee you numbers one and two you had no idea <laughs> so starting with number 10 Tom Petty I, I guess you know even though he's dead he's still raking in 95 million dollars a year or something like that it, it looks like Angus Young at number nine with 140 million dollars Dave Grohl uh, looks like he raked in uh, 280 million bucks. Uh, Dave Matthews, which Dave Matthews for real, 300 million dollars. Oh, I guess it says this is his net worth. Uh, number six, Eric Clapton, which uh, you know I suppose you could kind of guess that one, but but then again he's pretty old and he doesn't even really play anymore, so. $300 million is his worth. David Howell Evans, which of course is the edge, at number, what was that number five? At $340 million. Keith Richards at number four, no surprise there, at $340 million. Uh, number three, Bruce Springsteen. I wouldn't have guessed Bruce Springsteen would have been above Keith Richards, but then again, Keith Richards has to split his uh, all of his earnings like four ways, so Bruce Springsteen really doesn't. But then you get to number two, and uh, Toby Keith. I never would have guessed Toby Keith <laughs> at number two. But holy shit, there are a bunch of country fans, and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of people buying really crappy music. I mean, he's apparently racked up $500 million of net worth, uh, which is just mind-boggling. Because we'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. The fact that Toby Keith is just above Keith Richards. You know, it's just insane. And then number one, I just, I mean, my wife will absolutely have a field day with this. She can't stand Jimmy Buffett. But Jimmy Buffett, number one, unbelievable to me. That Jimmy Buffett would be worth $600 million. That a dude that writes, you know, about about walking on beaches and, and kicking back in the shade and shit is worth, you know, the better part of a billion dollars. <laughs> And I have to agree with my wife on this. I think Jimmy Buffett, you know, in spite of his legendary status, Jimmy Buffett has written some of the some of the worst, uh, most infectious earworms. I blew out my flip flop that have ever been written. And you know, once they're in there, Stepped on a pop top. they pretty much make you want to tear your brains out the back of your head. My brain away But anyway, yeah, those are the top 10 uh, highest paid guitarists in the world, according to therichest.com. So, you know, speaking of Facebook, I saw this on Facebook. Okay, Generation Xers, what did this remind you of? Of course, it reminded you of Police Academy. My name is the man with a better plan. How far did they how far up did they get in Police Academy? What was it like Police Academy 6 or something? Did they make like 6 of those? They made enough of them. <laughs> Also in the week in random, I stumbled across this. Uh, I've posted a video on Channel 2 <coughs> about the Theorbo. And the uh, regular Theorbo is a giant instrument. Uh, it's about 8 feet tall or something like that. I mean, it's long. Uh, and you could see the guy in the picture or the video that I took with my daughter. We went to a uh, concert. These people were playing Baroque music. Uh, one of them had a Theorbo, and it was just, it was enchanting music. But this, I thought, it was really cool, uh, extremely cool, in fact, because this instrument, I didn't know existed. This is like a guitar Theorbo. It's much more scaled down. It's not, not eight feet tall. This thing is only like, you know, maybe the size of a regular, 
a regular guitar. And it had, you know, has some bass strings. It reminds me of a harp guitar, you know, the harp guitars that we saw in the early 1900s. You know, Gibson made some of them, and Dyer Brothers made some examples of harp guitars and other manufacturers, too, around the turn of the last century. And that's what it kind of reminds me of, is a harp guitar. I wonder if the harp guitar actually just got its inspiration from this, the guitar Theorbo. Um, and this guy plays it absolutely beautifully. And you really should check this guy out. This is David Jakes. Or Jacques, David Jacques, perhaps. I'm not sure. Uh, but he's playing a, a, Theor, a guitar Theorbo made in 1798. So that's to me, is very interesting. And again, he plays it absolutely beautifully. So that now has gotten onto my bucket list. I need a guitar Theorbo. Anybody has a guitar Theorbo you want to send me, uh, I, I will gladly accept. Okay, so this is probably the coolest thing that I saw this week, and I just thought it was very interesting. Have you considered that your guitar's true tone is being held back by outdated circuits and components that are extremely limiting? What if we told you there was a way to unleash your guitar's true potential and enable every tone imaginable, all available right there at your fingertips? All in one guitar, in real time, mid-performance, even mid-song, always based around the real sound of your guitar. Nothing synthetic or digitized. Introducing the Everytone Smart Module and App. The Everytone Smart Module fits directly inside your guitar, where each of your guitar's pickup coils acquires its very own channel with independent gain. There is also Master Gain with multiband parametric EQ, master volume on your guitar, and Everytone's unique patented variable phase. You've effectively installed a Bluetooth-enabled, highly miniaturized multi-channel audio mixer inside your guitar. You can save each mix and recall it at any time. Along with the Everytone Smart Module, the Everytone app runs on Android and iOS to enable you to create, edit, and manage any number of tonal mixes. Each combination of settings, mix of pickup gains, variable phase pairings, and EQ are combined into a single tone patch file, which is saved on your mobile device backed up on your Everytone Cloud account, and of course, stored on your guitar. The app will also allow you to share your patches with friends, and even download them into a different Everytone fitted guitar. After having installed the ESM hardware, use our intuitive interface to register and pair your guitar and generate its very own guitar. You're then ready to start creating your tones patches. As well as having full control over the gain of each and every coil, we've developed something truly unique. Variable phase. Unlike on-off phase reversal switches, which often sound thin and uninteresting, our patented variable phase can shift phase from 30 up to 180 degrees between any pair of pickup coils of your choosing, even coils inside the same humbucker to give a much richer range of sounds. So how do you access your saved tones on your guitar? Well, when you install your ESM, you replace the controls. One of them has a very special function. We call it the magic wheel. It's a multicolor display. You turn the knob and the colors change. Each color represents a folder of toad patch files that you've saved. You customize the magic wheel any way to work best for how you choose to play. And what about the other control knobs you ask? What do they do? Well, the answer is anything you'd like. After the master volume and the magic wheel, all the other control knobs can be assigned to give you live onboard control of any parameter available in the app. So gain for coil three or frequency for mid parametric EQ or whatever. Every tone does nothing to hide or disguise the intrinsic tonal qualities of your guitar or its pickups. All signal paths are analog. Nothing is synthetic about your sound. Not only have you upgraded your guitar to its full tonal potential, it's now an Internet of Things device with lots of additional benefits, such as out-of-range theft control with a remote lockup function, unique ID registration, and increased protection for insuring. We believe that this is the biggest leap in guitar innovation since the humbucker. As always with something like this, you know, that is guitar tech, um, I always start out watching with a bit of a grain of salt and with a bit of a skeptic eye. 
and you know I, I'm kind of wondering to myself is this really something that anybody needs is this something that anybody wants or asked for and the more I thought about it the more the answer became yes uh, this is actually something very cool um, and it's not what I thought at first it's not some digital modeling thing uh, it actually is an analog processor I suppose it's like a multi-channel mixer that you install into your guitar so what happens is every single one of your pickups becomes and if you have a humbucking pickup every coil uh, becomes a signal input into this mixer okay so you imagine a mixer and you have certain inputs so with um, you know if you have a hum single hum guitar for instance you have one two three four five different inputs okay so you have five different potential signals that are going to be input into this little tiny powered mixer that's inside of your guitar so what it does is it takes all the this input and it is able to to change your controls on your guitar so you you can pair this thing with an app and you can actually using your app on on your phone or whatever it's bluetooth capable so you can actually dial into the thing with an app on your phone so you can sit here with your guitar on dial into it with bluetooth on your phone bring up the app and you can change the controls on your guitar so that you know you, the what was the volume control perhaps for the bridge pickup uh, now has become the volume control for the neck pickup or maybe the uh, tone control is now a master tone control or maybe maybe it uh, you can change the value of that tone control so that you know when you move it a certain amount it it will actually change the amount that you know it changes it's different than I suppose modeling it's not it's not modeling you're actually able to do a lot with this that I wouldn't have guessed uh, and actually it, and it makes sense the more you think about it so what they've managed to do here is they've managed to take let's say your humbucking pickup you have two coils in your humbucking pickup uh, they can actually change the degree to which the two coils are uh, parallel to one another or they hum cancel so they can actually change uh, by just by slight degrees the amount of phase cancellation so they can make it completely in phase uh, they can make it completely out of phase and hum canceling um, or they can do any any varying degrees uh, in between so it's just a really interesting technology uh, definitely something new uh, definitely something I thought at first that, that I was that you know I was skeptical about it and thought to myself, nobody needs this, nobody's going to want this. But then the more I kind of watched this video, the more I kind of had an epiphany that, yeah, they're, they're probably right. This is kind of cool. And, uh, and of course, you know, you're using actual pickups in the guitar, so you still need to be able to have different pickup configurations in order for this to actually work. And you have parametric EQ on board, all kinds of cool things. Uh, actually... <laughs> One of the things that kind of uh, struck me as funny the more I watched it was that, uh, you know, because because you can register the thing online uh, and because it's Bluetooth capable and, it you know, it actually will talk to your phone or whatever, you can actually remote shut the thing off. Uh, so if somebody steals your guitar, you can actually shut it down so they can't use the guitar. <laughs> so it just won't come on or whatever. When they plug it in, it just nothing will happen. So it's kind of like having OnStar for your guitar. Just kind of a funny thing. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Is this something that you guys would be interested in? Uh, watch the whole video. I, 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 I think it would do you well to watch this entire thing. Try to absorb what they're talking about here. Especially when they get into the, uh, you know, the ability to change phases uh, at any degree. Or to raise and lower the output signal of each individual coil. Just really interesting and basically in, an infinite number of com combinations you could have if you use something like this. So tell me what you think about this down below. I'd be really interested to hear what everybody thinks about it. And really my first thought when I, when I encountered this was, man, wouldn't it be awesome to have this pickup system in a Boaz guitar? Because <laughs> then you would have the ability to change the humbuckers and you're, you know, I just started brainstorming about that. Would be really interesting. But tell me what you think about it. Okay, so that's going to do it for the news.
while back, a fellow named Don uh, sent me a bunch of packages full of these catalogs, and he sent me a couple of boxes of stuff, and I opened a couple of them and started to kind of go through them here on this uh, on this channel. Uh, but he has since sent me like three more boxes, one, two of them being enormous. So what I thought I might do to round out this ship post Friday is is open the smaller box that he sent that I still haven't opened yet. So let's check that out. Okay, if you guys have not seen the two previous videos that I showed of Don's catalogs that he sent, I will put a card up in the, in the upper right-hand corner of the screen there where you can see a couple of those previous videos. I, I recommend you check those out. He, a lot of this stuff, Don had been collecting, obviously, for many, many years. He uh, apparently started doing this, I guess, in the mid to late 80s or... Maybe even the late 70s. The, the, the guy has all kinds of stuff. And we'll see what's in this particular box. We've got, uh, again, just a box chock full of old catalogs, man. I mean, this is just crazy, over-the-top amount of stuff um, that this dude has preserved over time. This is just a treasure trove, really, of, uh, of, of, of stuff. But this is uh, Brad. I'm running out of time here in Oregon, so I had to ship everything at once. Sorry to surprise you. This box contains some oddball stuff and some forgotten makes and models. Uh, some from well-known companies and some long-forgotten custom makers, maybe. The Audio-Technica phono cartridge was good the last time it was used about 30 or 40 years ago. Probably could use a new stylus. Enjoy. Cheers, Don. So he... I guess he gave me a Audio Technica stylus as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Don. Man, that's yep. Here we go. This cartridge is good. You might want to replace the stylus. Let's see. Let's see what he's given giving me here. That's an SS three thirty five. I think I. I think I might have something that could use that. As a matter of fact, I'm almost certain I do. So that's cool. That's really cool. Thank you. So that will go with my stylus clutch. And even if I don't have anything right now I could use that with, um, I'm always looking out for, um, as you guys probably have seen, I always get uh, vintage turntables and stuff and bring those home and try to give, give those a new home when I can. Give them a second life. So I'm sure I would find something to put it in. What do we have here? What is this? Uh, Tenic. Tenic. Never heard of Tenic before. The official sound for my road show is Tenic. Dick Clark. I have never before heard of this company. But see what I mean? Don is just, he's just got all this stuff uh, really nicely packaged. Everything is in. Everything is in plastic containers. I mean, he's just gone all out on this. And uh, it's amazing what he was able to collect over the years with this stuff. Does anybody have any Tenix stuff? Okay, this stuff is from New Jersey. Asbury Park, New Jersey. Who is that? Dale Wright and the Wright guys. Never heard of them. Obviously, I've heard of Dick Clark. Tenic. By Mid-Eastern Industries Incorporated. Look at that thing. What the hell? A GB5000 Tenic. Super powerhouse that breaks the sound barrier. What a weirdo amp company, dude. I've never even heard of this. Did it say from New Jersey? Yeah, New Jersey. I almost have to wonder. I wonder if these were affiliated in any way with Gregory Amps. Just because it's kind of the same time period. It's New Jersey. It's funky. It couldn't have lasted that long, really, Tenic is sound. There they are again. 
T220, T250, T... I guess this is all solid state stuff. So what is this? Probably around about 1969, 1970. Right around there, I would guess. That is... Intriguing. Uh, does anyone out there have any of this stuff? Tinnick. And this Baron. Okay, so this. Yep, this is also solid state, but check that out. It's just like the Tinnick stuff. It, they've got the controls recessed into the front. Just funky. Look at that. And they're lit up too. Huh. <laughs> Wow. Look at the lights. It's pretty pretty gimmicky, but I can't, you know, it's it's amazing that even even now, you know, after years and years and years of seeing this stuff uh, seeing all kinds of different amplifiers and just about, you know, you would think that surely I would have seen it all, you know, by now. Just after 27, almost 30 years of playing guitar and trading guitar and, you know, fixing amps and looking for old amps and all this stuff, you would think that I would have seen it all, but I still haven't, and this is proof. Tinnick and Baron amplifiers. Just strange. It's just amazing the extreme amount of care uh, that went into packaging all this as well. Let's see. Uh, what does he say about this? Tenic solid state amps built by a government defense contractor in Asbury Park, New Jersey, no less. Amps look like giant wall heaters endorsed by Dick Clark. Woohoo. Wonder what became of Dale Wright and the Wright guys. Yeah, no shit. Or Jimmy Stokely and the Exiles. I have never seen this stuff. No, I have not. Uh, Don, that's the weirdest. That's some of the weirdest shit I've ever seen. To be honest with you. And I've seen some weird shit. Let's we'll see what we have here. Demarzio collection. Uh, good reference info for guitar text. Very popular pickups back in the day. Don't know much about current trends. But the thing about Demarzios in the '70s, those things are hard to date. I do know that, because DiMarzio's, they pretty much, you know, they didn't do anything different from, like, uh, when they began, I guess, what, in the early 70s? Um, you know, they only had, really, a, one or two pickups. It was really only, the Super Distortion was their main thing. That was, like, the original, uh, you know, upgrade thing for guitars back in the day, and it all started in the early 70s with DiMarzio's Super Distortion pickup. And to try to date those or to differentiate like an early 70s one from like a late 70s or even an early 80s one. I don't even know if that's possible to do that. Um, maybe somebody at DiMarzio could do that. Um, but I, I just don't know. The DiMarzio Guide for the Practical Guitarist. Yeah, see what I mean? This is like, this is really the beginnings of, of all of it. DiMarzio started it all. All of the uh, upgrade stuff, you know, the whole upgrade your guitar craze began right here with DiMarzio. I don't know how old this particular... This looks like it's probably more 80s. Tips to make sure your guitar works properly. Bunch of... I don't know what my wife has put in the uh, washing machine in there, but the damn thing is beating like crazy, so I don't know. Maybe the dog is in there trying to escape. Yeah, this is definitely uh, this is definitely a more recent um, catalog because you know they have a wider range of of pickups and possibilities. But, you know, in the beginning, it would have just been basically basically a super distortion. I had one of these X2N DiMarzios in, a, in, a, uh, in an Ibanez once. And it was, it was definitely, that was a high output pickup. Uh, great if you're doing like, um, 
you know, 80s metal, that sort of thing. Tips on how to replace your pickups. Um, so it gets a lot of good information there. Installing fork. Uh, this is all stuff, though, that's, you know, would be found on online now. But installing four conductor pickups, and it gets just a whole tutorial right there on how to install four conductor pickups. So this would have been a really good little pamphlet to have back in the day because you've got, you know, your wiring diagrams and the whole nine yards. Right there. Parts that touch the strings. The ever important parts that touch the strings. And look, DiMarzio was doing the... Uh, uh, they were doing all the brass stuff. You know, adds weight, adds sustain. This does not have a year on it. So I'm not sure what year this is. Anybody know? That's cool. Look at that. That looks awesome. I think this might be a little bit older. This is 1275. This might be from 1975. Or at least some of the pictures are from 75. Right? And the artists are certainly all 70s. There's Al Demiola, Rick Derringer, Montrose. Yeah, man. So let's see what we got. That's I love the colors on that. Here in person, it's like a it's like really purple. Really interesting. Price list. Look at that. Even this far back, it costs seventy nine bucks for a super distortion. You know that's not cheap for back in the day, but it but you know it turns your guitar into a different guitar. <laughs> you could take a cheap guitar and slap a, a DiMarzio pickup in it, and it would suddenly be a hot rod, you know? So, let's see, we got comparison of output of Fat Strat versus stock Fender Strat pickups. Yeah, there's a photo from late 76, so... Couldn't have been any earlier than that. Yeah, but see what I mean? They've got, what, one, two, three, four, five. I would say this is late 70s. This is probably 1977, you know, around about there. And they've got one, two, three, four, five different um, pickups to choose from at this point. What's this? Another output comparison chart right there. I'm trying to show you guys all this stuff. You know, if you want to pause it, if you want to do screenshots, you can. Um, you know, if you have an old DiMarzio and you're trying to... If you're like me and you like to date things just, just because it's fun, you know, I mean... Um, a lot of times you'll get more money if you can pin down a date too for something if you're trying to sell something. But even if you're not trying to sell something, it's just it's just fun to do all the legwork, you know, to do the Sherlock Holmes thing, you know, and fig try to figure out how old something is. Uh, and may I don't know, maybe this uh, some of this will help you if you're into that sort of thing. There's uh, Al Demiola there as well, kind of a cool little brochure. Uh, this one is 1977. Look at that. The year I was born, 1977. How do you choose a pickup? And again, the Super Distortion is front and center because that's the one that they basically started with. They started the company with the Super Distortion early 1970s. Um, and it just became a thing, man. And I think, um, what was it, BC Rich, didn't they put uh, Super Distortions in from the factory and a lot of their guitars in the 70s because bc rich was kind of like you know they were like the first one of the first sort of boutique you know super guitars that was being made alembic also in the 70s you know was kind of in the same vein you know doing a lot of uh 
uh, multi-piece laminated neck through bodies and all that kind of stuff and uh, and also you know like I said putting uh, super distortions in from the factory in the early 70s there's a super 2 so by this time by 77 they had a super 2 Fat Strat, the pre pre BS Telly, the pre pre BS. <laughs> How's that for a name? Pre BS. <laughs> SD one, model one base. So how? So they'd actually up their game here. Added a few more models by this point. What is this key mix system? I've never seen that before. What is that? A key mix system. So this has got uh, acoustic. These are like a. These are a little acoustic pickups, uh, transducers. Yeah, a transducer piano pickup. Oh, okay, so I guess these will plug in. This is like for a piano for keys or keyboard. So you would you would put you know plug these in at different spots on the on the keyboard and then put it through the mixer so you could dial everything in yeah see okay yeah standard standard or optional equipment on these guitars Bernie Rico which is BC Rich Dean Julian Hamer SD Curly Vulcan I've never uh, I don't remember hearing about Vulcan or Julian. I don't remember those. Spectre, Odyssey. I've heard of Odysseys. Northern Audio, Valeno, Suntech, or Tama. Tama, of course, would be Ibanez stuff. Very cool. I like that brochure a lot. That's that's a this this whole thing. Like I said. And we're just at the, <laughs> we're at the second little packet. And look, we've got packet after packet after packet after packet. And this dude, Don, has sent me um, umpteen <laughs> different boxes like this. Uh, <laughs> just chock full of this stuff, man. I, we could sit down for a year straight and just do nothing but make videos going through all of this stuff. Okay, this is the 1978 catalog. So, I mean, we've got the full history basically of... DiMarzio here. You know, I mean, the full early history of DiMarzio is, is right here. This is just insane. God, that is, that's so cool with those super distortions. I mean, that's classic right there. And they started coming in with acoustic pickups, magnetic pickups. And then they've got their little acoustic transducer buttons as well. There's an upgraded version of the key mix system. That's cool. I love that t-shirt. I'd love to have that t-shirt. That reminds me, I've been I've been online just kind of, you know, every now and then I'll just kind of look at old stuff just to see what kind of prices old vintage you know vintage things bring and my god uh, vintage band t-shirts man from like the 80s and the 90s even are uh, getting really expensive people are paying some stupid crazy money for a band t-shirts now um, and I would imagine also anything like that if you have a t-shirt in your closet you know that's that's like that uh, you should look it up on eBay, man, and see what that kind of stuff is bringing now. It's crazy. Um, here's another 78 catalog. It's basically, I guess it's the same thing, just in a different format. But, uh, yeah, very cool. Again, there's that T-shirt. And their whole lineup of accessories. But, yeah, just very cool. And that's just, a, you know, again, um, another piece of 
DiMarzio history and then you've got things like you know when you see the pictures like this and you're nailing it down to certain years and you've got you know pictures of artists with their straps and their guitars and you can see all the different models everybody was using at the time um, just just cool stuff man there's Roy, Roy Buchanan Nuge, Al Demiola, it's cool. And here we've got what seventy nine suggested retail price list. Man, what has she put in that fucking? What has she put in that washer? That's rattling around like that. I'm right next to the washroom, so if you hear some beating and banging in the background, that's not somebody trying to get out of a closet. You know, that's not like a hooker trying to get out of a closet or anything. That's <laughs> I haven't locked up anybody in my basement here. That's just uh, that's the washer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, man. I can't thank you enough, uh, Don, for sending me all this stuff for us to look at on this channel uh, obviously there are going to be many more videos like this of the stuff that Don has sent and we'll just go through this stuff man probably a little a little bit at a time as we find the time you know if we have a slow news week or something like that especially we'll go we'll probably go through more of this stuff I'll probably upload some channel 2 videos uh, just kind of sitting around and going through this stuff when I have some downtime so yeah uh, thank you Don thank you guys for watching and that'll do it for Shit Post Friday Hit subscribe down below, and for now, y'all take care.